Hello, everyone. On behalf of Paraclete Press, welcome to this virtual launch of The City is My Monastery, a contemporary rule of life by Richard Carter. My name is Rachel McKendry. I'm the publicist here at Paraclete. We're so honored to have you with us today, Richard, and thank you to all of you for joining us. Richard Carter is a priest at St. Martin in the Fields in central London and leader of its Nazareth community, a new monastic community in the Church of England. I'd like to invite everyone listening now to take a moment to find the chat button and also the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Please feel free to submit any questions or thoughts you might have for Richard through the launch today, and we'll have a time for Q&A later on. Thank you so much, Richard, for this beautiful book, for being with us today. Richard's joining us from London, so <laughs> Richard, do you mind unmuting yourself? There yeah. we go, now we can hear you. Well, thank you for inviting me to talk about the book, especially on such a momentous day. And I uh, just wanted everyone to know that uh, United States of America are very much in our prayers here at St. Martin's today and in the whole of our country's prayers as you uh, make important decisions and we'll be with you in prayer. Thank you so much. Um, Richard, I, you know, just reading through the book again, first thing, of course, I was struck by is the opening of the book with that beautiful story about the cross. And I wondered if you could tell that story and um, tell why you chose to begin the book that way. Well, the, the cross is actually hanging around my neck, and that is the sign of, of the community that we formed. It's, it's the Lampedusa cross. It's a cross that comes from the island of Lampedusa, which is the island that many refugee boats coming across from Africa and all over the world have actually landed on the, on the, on the journey to, uh, to um, Europe and then to the United Kingdom. And uh, um, one of the boats um, uh, sunk. There were 500 people on board and 300 people lost their lives on that crossing to Lampedusa. And there's a carpenter there um, called Mr. Tuccio, who, who wanted to respond to that tragedy. And, and many of the, of the refugees on the boat who'd lost their lives were Christians from Eritrea and Ethiopia. And uh, he took the wreckage of the boat and he made these small crosses for each of the of the refugees who'd survived and on them on, on, on them he said this is a sign of of Christ's presence even in times of suffering and uh, a lot of my work at St Martin in the Fields involves working with people who are homeless people who are destitute or from from all walks of life but many of them um, refugees and uh, it seemed that this would be a wonderful sign of, of Christ's presence even in suffering and the way that we discover we discover our true humanity when when we listen and when we learn from people who have made those huge journeys in their lives. I'm so glad you used the word journey because as I read this book and come to know a little bit more about you I'm fascinated by your journey when we think about monasticism, I think typically most of us think of leaving the city and going to the desert. And here you've made that voyage, but then you've journeyed back. Yes. And I would love to hear a little bit more about your journey in that way. Well, for 15 years of my life, I, I was a priest and I lived in Guadalcanal on the island of Guadalcanal in the South Pacific, well known to United States of America because that's where in the Second World War the huge battle with Japan took place in the South Pacific. But I worked in the whole of that province of Melanesia, Papua New Guinea, Solomon Islands, Fiji, Vanuatu, and it was an incredible place to live because in many ways it's a very simple lifestyle but very close to God in that you depend upon God for all things, for the food that you plant in the gardens when you go out fishing in the small fishing boats. Uh, everything was, was, was God was very, very abundantly 
uh, present all around us. And uh, I was the chaplain to a very big community there, 400 brothers and a brother myself living very simply without electricity, without running water, all those kind of things that we take for granted in the Western world. But this deep sense of God's presence and deep realization of our, our, um, our dependence upon God in all things. And then from there, I, I came on a kind of mission to the United Kingdom, which was originally my home where I was brought up and went to university. And uh, as I was going around the churches here, we're doing the mission. One of the churches we came to was this church here in Trafalgar Square, St. Martin in the Fields, a very famous church on the edge of Trafalgar Square. And the vicar then at that time, a man called Nicholas Holton, now a bishop, he, he said to me, if ever you think of coming back to this country to minister, I think this is the kind of place you should minister. And a few years later, I did come back. And one of the rules of the brotherhood I'd served in the South Pacific was that our life and our formation as a community should not be permanently within the community. Oh. But that we should go back to our places where we came from, a bit like a, a Buddhist monk does, and uh, become like salt within our local community. And so I, I decided to make that journey back to the United Kingdom and to the edge of Trafalgar Square, which any of you have ever come to Trafalgar Square, you'll know it's probably the center of London where the big public square. <laughs> and I, I moved into the house next door to the church. And literally I'd come from the South Pacific and I thought, I'm never gonna sleep here. The noise was all around me, the sirens, the, the neon. It, it's a place that never sleeps. They say New York never sleeps or Trafalgar Square <laughs> never sleeps. And uh, for the first three weeks, I thought, I mean, what have I done? You know, I felt like a fish out of water. But slowly, I've been here 15 years. And over the years, I began to realize that it's, it, this is a real calling and that many of the things, the simple values that I'd learned in the Solomon Islands are so much needed in the city. The, the need for a rhythm of prayer which will hold us, which will, which will be like our heartbeat in the middle of all the stress and the anxiety of, of living in the city. The need for real service and compassion where we're not just giving out you know, a one-way kind of direction, but the way I'd learnt in the Solomon Islands, which is true community, the reciprocity of community, the way the feeding of the 5,000 is about everybody sharing their gifts. And the need really for community, because there is in our modern cities a great loneliness and a longing for not just more busyness in a church, not more, just more activity in a church, but a, a deeper humanity, a deeper way of discovering yourself and your neighbor and the wonder of God. And after about 12 years of living here and working, in this church I remember thinking that it was probably time I should move on and I was offered a place uh, in, a, in the monastery to go and work where they were looking for a guardian of the monastery and I moved out of the city and I and my vicar here said well go and explore and so I went there for a, a month to see if that this was the right place for me to go and I prayed and I thought and I drank in the silence and I loved the community life because it's very much part of my own life. But I kept on hearing God saying to me, the city is your monastery. That's where, that's where this presence is needed. This is where people are hungry for spiritual depth. This is the way where so many people are, are searching for, for God. The, the city is your monastery. Go back to the city. So I, after a month, I came back and, 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 and I said, I, I think I've made my decision. And he said, what's that? And I said, I think it's here that I need to be. And he said, I'm so pleased you said that. <laughs> and so I, I started this Nazareth community and we thought it would be about five or 10 people. 
but already we've we've got 85 members and and um we've also got many people who are companions but looking to live in a city in a more holistic way in a way where god is at the very center of all that they do um people who are familiar with monastic spirituality know the idea of a rule of life but so did you create this rule specifically for the Nazareth community? Yeah, I mean, when, when, a, when a community is formed, it's often the way that you write a rule of life for the community. But the, way, the, the wording rule of life terrifies the 21st century because people think, <laughs> oh, I'm gonna fail. If I make a rule, it's gonna be like a New Year's resolution after only a, a couple of weeks, I'm gonna think, oh, I didn't do that, and I didn't do that, and I didn't do that. But, I, I read, I read, and I'd been very influenced by Brother Roger of the Taizé community in France, and he he said you must pray a rule of life into being. That you don't just sort of write a rule of life cold like a, a, the Ten Commandments on a piece of stone. You you pray it, and and um, so for a year I had two or three people here who I had identified were people who who had a similar longing as me and so for uh, for the first year we just we just began to live this 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 way of life and to pray the community into being and i wanted a rule that was not sort of some form of judgment which would tell you you had failed but something which was a, a discipline which was a a, a deeper listening an obedience which allowed a greater freedom and um, when people shy away from the word rule of life and a lot of people before they join the community say oh I'm never going to be able to do all those things and I said it's not a question of beating yourself up it's actually about allowing yourself a rule which will 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 find a freedom within you a bit like a runner you know when a runner starts to run and you do your first couch potato to five kilometers the first couple of kilometers are killers but once you get to five kilometers it's actually quite a lot easier to run seven kilometers or so i've been told <laughs> and and actually the the more you live the discipline the freer you become think of a pianist learning to play you know i never got past three blind mice but when you practice the actual the discipline of playing actually sets you free and other instruments begin to join the orchestra and that's what we found with with this rule of life that when we start to to live it other people are attracted other people are pulled in as well and each person in the community offers a different strength we are we are more than individuals we're we're the sum of our different parts and you know, someone may be a great prayer, but another person might be a great um, musician or a great singer, or everybody has their a great, full of compassion or a great worker. Everybody has their different gifts. And, and so the rule becomes like an orchestra. It becomes a collection of the, of the many people who take part. Can you tell us more about the Nazareth community and what you do and how it's grown? Well, the, the rule of life, um, it, it has, seven, has seven pillars, if you like, seven, it's seven S's. And they are, the first one is, is silence. You may think silence is a strange way to begin and everyone throws up this, oh, I'm frightened of silence. You know? <laughs> but actually, I think silence is, is, is like the soil. Silence is the ground from which everything else grows. And so really the Nazareth community began with a desire for silence. In other words, often the church becomes more and more active and thinks in terms of events and programs and a bit like a, a circus act spinning plates. Sometimes you just have to let all the plates fall on the ground and, and begin with the silence. And that's what we did. We began one Lent with silence. So we kept an hour of silence 
and people said, oh, no one will come for an hour of silence. And I said, well, if you go to the park, you'll find people running for an hour. If you go to the gym, you'll find people exercising for an hour. If you go to a, 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 a Zen meditation class, you'll find people sitting for an hour or lots of things like Tai Chi or, or wonderful exercises that people do. We have these wonderful, within the Christian tradition, we have these wonderful sacred spaces, but we're, we're frightened of, of opening them up for the sacred. So I said, what about if I just open up the church early in the morning for an hour of silence? And people say, oh, I'm sure that no one will want to come for that. But people do want to come. And um, I mean, during this lockdown, I've been doing a, a meditation on, on Saturday mornings and thousands of people have been joining. It's, um, it's a, a longing for a, for a greater depth. So the Nazareth community really began with that, with that meditative silence and finding the stillness. And of course, as soon as you search for stillness and silence, you begin to realize that our minds are like waterfalls, full of noise and full of clutter and full of all the kind of distractions that everyone feels. And so part of silence is, is learning how to cope with that, learning how to cope with our with our demons, with our stresses, with our anxieties, with our, with our gifts and knowing how to celebrate the silence. So uh, silence was the first thing of the Nazareth community. But silence leads us, I think, to become more compassionate because it, it opens our eyes, it makes us more attentive. And I think a lot of compassion in, in the modern world, unfortunately, has become removed so, so people feel quite isolated from being able to be compassionate and they can feel almost distanced from the objects of their compassion and this lockdown has been an experience of that so in our rule of life i said that our service to one another needs to be face to face we need to meet people and maybe your act of service is visiting your mother Maybe your act of service is spending a couple of hours each week helping your, your child with his reading. Or maybe your act of service is, is visiting the lady down the road who, who couldn't get out to do her shopping. Or maybe it's becoming a prison visitor, or maybe it's more dramatic. It's, it's, it's a more radical form of service, but it's face-to-face -face because I think once we enter into face-to-face -face service, then we begin to see it's not a one-way process. It's a, it's a give and a take, it's a reciprocal relationship. And my service here was to the most wonderful congregation from all walks of life, from people from the very highest you know, occupations in the land to the people who were completely destitute. And one of the wonderful things of working here is that they sit down side by side and the Nazareth community is made up of people who are homeless, people who are refugees and other people who have, you know, very um, work with, you know, big status or whatever. So all walks of life, but that everybody has a story and everybody has a voice and something to share. And the next part of the rule of life, it was, so it was silence, and then service, and then sacrament, trying to realize that sacrament is not just a little piece of bread on the altar on a Sunday, but sacrament is the visible sign of Christ present in our lives. And so we are all sacraments. Everyone you meet in the street has the potential of being a sign of God. If only we have time to, to see it or to recognize it or to discover it in one another. So it's this sacramental life that we've tried to develop which was the third S. And then, of course, scripture. Of course, when you do scripture at church, often people think it's about how much you know and you know whether you've done your biblical criticism or not. But of course, real understanding of scripture is allowing the scriptures to be completed in us. 
allowing the word of God to come alive in our own lives and to listen to the word of God coming alive in other people's lives. So our Bible study has followed the Benedictine idea of Lectio Divina, where you really listen to one another, exploring how the word of God is speaking to them in a very kind of personal and, and, and contemporary context. So silence, service, sacrament, scripture, and then sharing. One of the things I'd learned in the South Pacific was the, the God-given nature of sharing with one another. And so we meet together as a community to share where everyone is given a voice and everyone has a space. And food, of course, is really important in sharing. We've not been able to do that during the lockdown, but we've been sharing like this on Zoom and we've been sharing in other ways. And of course, we've had our church open for the last, since July, and we've been able to share there, but you may have heard on Thursday, we're locking down again. But sharing, really important. And then the last two S's, Sabbath time. Sabbath is the realization that we, we don't have a rest so that we can work harder, but we work in order to find rest. And rest is the time where we become most fully ourselves. God rests on the Sabbath and realizes the wonder of all that he has made. And so the community is encouraged to, to discover the things that are wonderful in their lives, not to feel that rest is a, is a kind of an escape or rest is something that they should apologize for, but that we, we actually need to rest. That the modern way of living is, 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 is depleting us, is running us dry. And that actually those things in our lives that are life-giving are absolutely essential. So walking or working in your garden, or you can rest by working in your garden, or listening to music or going to the theater or visiting someone you love or having a friendship which is life-giving. All these things are part of Sabbath time, I think. And so part of our community life is actually timetabling or putting in your diary the time which is going to be life-giving for you. And then the final S of the Nazareth community is staying. It's a, it's a promise of stability. It's like, I'm not just gonna do this as a sort of like a diet, you know, for for seven days and they think oh no I'm gonna hate all this I'm gonna binge it's actually it's actually trying to discover a rhythm a rhythm that is sustainable a rhythm that is beautiful a rhythm that can make you more truly yourself a rhythm that can set you free and uh and so hopefully the staying with is about is about learning to, to, to love a way of life that is probably simpler, slower, hopefully it has removed some of the clutter and created some more space, which has allowed you to breathe in and to recognize all around you the wonder of, of the world entrusted into our care. And it's not so driven, I think, I think our modern way of living is so driven, so often so driven that we have no time to recognize the presence of God around us. You mentioned that you're about to go into lockdown again. I know so many churches, which is where people find community, I think most strongly, have still not been able to meet together here in the United States or have chosen not to in an attempt to keep people safe. Um, yeah. with this with the structure of community keeping a rule it feels not easier but you have the support of the people who are walking with you yes how how does that change or how is that possible in the times when the community is is separated like this well when i when i wrote when i wrote the city is my monastery it was before i mean i had no idea that london would become like a monastery 
it was almost it was almost strange that the, the book was published here in the United Kingdom in November and the lockdown began the following March. Mm. And suddenly I saw the whole of the city deserted. I mean, Trafalgar Square, as I told you, never ever sleeps. And suddenly I looked out of my window here and it was completely empty. <sighs> it was eerily empty and it was, um, and a lot of people found that quite frightening. Um, and at the same time, though it was empty, the people who were left behind when everyone else ran away to their safe places were of course, some of the most destitute. So although uh, uh, housing agencies did a lot of good work trying to get homeless people into alternative accommodation, outside where I'm living in Trafalgar Square, there were a lot of homeless people, mm. and a lot of people who had nowhere to isolate. So you had this situation of of a city that had suddenly stopped, and yet a lot of the people um, who were the poorest with nowhere to go. Yeah. And suddenly the, the rule of life that, that I'd, I'd written actually began to make more sense than ever. It became for those who were part of the community, a structure, a kind of a rhythm that held us through those months. And the silence helped us to begin to see that even in the pain and the, and the struggle and, the, and, and the, the, the difficulty that everyone was facing, there was also a beauty that was opening up. In other words, people were having time to, um, to go out walking or to smell and breathe cleaner air or, and the colors seemed brighter. I mean, I don't know whether you recognize this in America as well, but certainly you did in London that, that you know the kind of smog lifted and everything seemed to come into focus and people began to say I don't want to go back to living in the same way that I've been living mm. for so long I just don't want to go back into that rat race mm. and so the kind of rule I'd like of life I, I, I had been writing or began to really speak to people I think and um the service too, because we couldn't just leave people in the street with, with, with nothing, but we, we started to, you know, to work out plans like we became a kind of kitchen for, for feeding people. And, and, and it was wonderful the way local, local businesses started helping, like the Indian Punjab restaurant started helping me do the cooking and we started feeding and trying to provide for people in the streets with face masks and hand gels and bottles of water and hot meals and things. And the, the, the word of God, the, the study of the scripture, which began to open up online with more people joining us in small groups to, to, to discover how God was speaking to us. They say scripture speaks strongest when something is at stake in your life. And I think we, we found that. You know, if you read scripture like it's a kind of academic text, it's, it's kind of removed from us. But when, when your life is at stake and you, you realize Jesus setting out with his disciples and there's a storm on the lake, you begin to, to live that and realize that, yes, you know, this, these words are speaking to us now. It's interesting when you say your life is at stake, I think about um, a lot of monasteries or you know spiritual houses are sort of removed again in the desert you are right in the heart of things and um i think about the vulnerability of living that very open door um given life of service in the middle i mean the pandemic is dangerous but city life in general is dangerous i um thinking about the story that you tell in the book in the in the section on sacrament about the man who comes into the church with the backpack on and there's an element of danger and yeah. yet I would think because of the rule you're living you were able to respond the way you did you must face that every day yeah there's a the the, the thing I love about this church is that you never know who's going to come through the door. I mean, I know, I think some people would have found that 
threatening, but I found it wonderful. I, I loved it straight away. And when I, when I first came to the church, I kept on thinking, who is my community going to be here? And then I suddenly realized that the community were those who came who had nowhere else to go, you know? So maybe that was, has always been something of my calling. Maybe I've always felt a bit on the edge myself. So I kind of, I kind of found in, in, in people who came into St. Martin's, I suppose I found Christ in them. And so they were, there is always threat. There is always fear. There's always the sense that, oh, you know, will I get this virus or, you know, this is frontline work, but, but we are always very careful as well. We're not, we're not foolish, but there is always, and I think anyone who's done ministry like this will, will tell you the same, that you always feel almost privileged to be, to be helping people like that. I'll just tell you a story. There's a whole group on my doorstep who are, who are homeless. And um, I just came in a, about a week ago and, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a difficult time in London that the, 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 um, the, the um, you know, COVID is increasing and it's, it's not an easy place to be on the street. And uh, I came in, they were all gathered around my, my front door and I kind of had to say, excuse me, I need to get through the front door, you know, kind of thing. And oh yes, yeah, yeah. And they all studied clear and they're all very polite moving out the way. And then one woman, you know, an elderly woman who's homeless, she just said to me, stay safe father and I went into the door and I, I shut the door and I thought you know here am I in a house with all the luxuries of heating lighting bed you know everything provided. here is a homeless woman on the door and she didn't say it sarcastically she said stay safe because she cared about me <laughs> yeah uh. I, I'm, I'm constantly in positions like that you know where where you kind of expect one thing and you you suddenly see Christ in, in I was I there's a story in the book which I tell I'm I'm doing a Bible study with with homeless people and um we do the Bible study of the of the scene from um uh, Mary Magdalene in the in the garden uh, of the tomb uh, who sees the gardener and thinks sees Jesus and thinks he's the gardener and of course, Jesus says to her, Mary, and, 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 and she recognizes him. And I asked them to imagine that they were in the garden and that, um, that they'd seen the risen Jesus. And uh, we kind of meditated on it and imagined it. And then I asked them to say, what would you, what would you say to Jesus? You know, what, would you, what would be your words to Jesus if you saw him? in the garden and here's a homeless man all right he said to me he thought for a mile he said i'd ask him if i could bind his hands i said what he said i'd ask him if he'd allow me to bind his hands because his wounds are still bleeding and I was just um, amazed at this. And so I said to him, and what does Jesus say to you? He said, no, I, I don't need you to bind my hands. I'm showing you my hands because my wounds are the signs of my love for you. Now that's, <laughs> that's from a homeless man who's living on the street, but it's just humbling to hear something like that. Because, you know, it's not something I would have ever thought of thinking myself, but here's a man who knows what it is to struggle. And the first thing he thinks of doing for Jesus is to help him because his hands are wounded. And there's so often situations in my life where I've, I've come across people who you know, like if you just walk past, you would judge them and you'd say, oh, you know, that maybe they're an alcoholic or they're a drug addict or whatever. But when you, when you really give them attention, you realize that, that everybody carries within them the wounds of Christ and everyone has the possibility of showing Christ to you. You tell another story in the book about... Um... I believe it was a passion narrative 
And was it a refugee who, who you want, to, who is going to be playing the part of Jesus? Yeah. That's, yeah. that's another, what the story you're telling reminds me of that, of a man who literally had walked through so many things. There is a, I, there's a, 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 I do a passion play every year and I always try and get different people to play the part of Jesus. So one year we had a, uh, uh, a, a wonderful woman in our congregation who runs our disability awareness group and she played the part of Jesus from a wheelchair and it was incredibly powerful especially when they started to attack Jesus and um, and push him about and she was in this wheelchair and in the drama the wheelchair falls over and she you know it, to see something like that you suddenly realize what how violence how violent violence is. But the story you're talking about, uh, Rachel, is I asked a refugee who had been badly tortured in his home country to play the part of Jesus. And he was a quite a vulnerable young man. And uh, he kept on not turning up to the, the rehearsals. And I was going, oh, no, this is good. And he said, uh, oh, I've had this problem. I've had this problem. And I said, yeah. I said, I know you've had these problems, Capano, but I... I can't do a passion play without Jesus. <laughs> and uh, he kind of got it. And he started coming to the rehearsals and I began to see him grow as he played the part of Jesus. It was like he kind of grew in stature. And um, when he played the part of Jesus and he cried out from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You could have heard a pin drop in the whole church because I think it was obvious to everyone that the cry that he cried from the cross was the cry of his own life. You know, he, he knew what it was like to, to be tortured. He'd been tied up in a sack and pushed underwater. And he knew what it was like to, to, to face that incredible fear that Christ felt. And yet, he was radiant. He told me afterwards it's the best thing he'd ever done in his life because he suddenly realized that, you know, he'd always seen himself as the victim. But when he played that part, he could see himself as someone who could be a savior. Mm. Amazing. I love the phrase that you use about the Nazareth community being at the heart and on the edge. Oh yeah, that's become that's become the kind of mission statement of our church. At the heart, because you know that's where Christ needs to be at the very heart of our lives, our own lives, our individual lives. You know, the heart of our life, the pumping heart. You know, the the, the breath right at the centre of our bo own bodies, and for us here in 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 London, at the heart of the city. You know, not just a church, you know, um, for its own sake, but actually relating to the problems and issues of, of the city, just as, you know, you, you will be today. We're on the edge of Trafalgar Square, so if there's a, a terrorist attack or a, a national disaster or a moment of grief or a, a demonstration, it will come to Trafalgar Square. We can't be a, a church which, which ignores that. You know, we've got to be at the heart of what's happening in our nation. And yet on the edge, realizing that Christ's voice is, is often not the voice which is the most powerful, mm. but, but, but the voice that comes from the, from the edge of the, of the square, the, the forgotten voice which actually can speak truth to power. Amen, let's hope. <laughs> Richard, what would you say um, to a reader who's not necessarily part of a community or even part of a church who's picking up your book for the first time and looking for a life with spiritual structure? I find that I could read this book so easily and glean so much from it, but in terms of putting into practice right away, or perhaps taking those one step at a time, like you said at the beginning. <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's not a, how should I say, I, I've always 
shied away from the ideas of sort of holy books, you know, books that that make you feel like you're failing. I, 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 I wouldn't want to write a book like that. What I want to write a book about is the way God can permeate our lives. You know, God can filter into everything we do. We can we can breathe God in. You, you don't have to be go into holy mode in order to find God. You don't have to even go into a church to find God. And um, you don't even have to be a Christian. I, I, oh, this sounds an awful thing to say, but you don't even have to be a Christian to find God. What I've found here is that we can find God in, in people from all, all faith backgrounds. And when you live in a city, you begin to see that they, everyone can become our teacher. So this, this book, um, The City is My Monastery, is, is, really a, is really a call to, to look for God in your own context, to search for God in your own, your own life, in your own heartbeat, and, and to find a rhythm of life or to find a structure of life that can can allow that to come alive in you and um i i hope i mean people dip into this book and read out little bits of it but i do think that it's got a kind of a structure that you need to follow mm -hmm. but a lot of people read it once and then sort of say oh it's the kind of book that i keep by my bedside because i can keep on dipping into and i hope it's like that and I hope it's not just my stories. I hope that the stories in here will encourage you to imagine and dream and discover for yourself. Because I talk about all things and all people and I'm sure around you there are the signs and the symbols and the, the sacraments of Christ. I'd like just to, to read you and I think this is a, maybe a, a, a bit of the, the book you could all identify with or, or at least have a, a sense of. The, the part of the book is called Staying with Love. Before I read it, I just say it's about my mother. My mother has very bad dementia and, and um, on, you know, quite a quite a, a difficult form of dementia in that it's um, it's called Lewy bodies. And so it, it makes her behavior, you know, change. And, and it's quite strange to, to meet with her. But I wrote this for her, but it's about the way love, the love of Christ, which is at the center of my life and the center of, 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 of our calling is um, unconditional. And, this is what I've written. Love waits for you at the station, filled with joy at your coming. Love waits outside a doctor's surgery or in a car drive home. Love frustrates you, irritates you, gets in your way, longs for you, hopes, worries, wants to do it for you, knows jealousy, protects, confronts, defends, flashes with anger at your selfishness or neglect, longs for your success, and yet loves you exactly as you are. Through years of imperfection, love waits at the door for your return. Under the hanging basket of flowers you gave them years before. And love welcomes the whole of you. The bed is prepared with the towel, the endless cooking of food you like, the room that you painted 20 years ago is waiting. The photo on the bedside that was taken of you in your childhood and the thousand memories that pierce your heart with affection and concern and fear of loss. This love is home, a home to which you will return in search again and again. For this is the one who is watching and waiting and whose eyes you know better than your own. And the clothes that were yours 
carefully folded, that have been kept in the drawer for your return. And the clock on the wall, already aching with the tick of departure. So this book really is a, is a story of love. It's a story of God's love for us and our call to, to return to that love. And I think all of us in our lives have had experience of that love. And, uh, and yet we need, we need the structure to discover it again, to breathe it again, to, to return to our true selves and not just get caught up in the kind of yeah. kind of competition that takes us away from who we truly are. Thank you. I, I was chuckling when you made mention of the fact that you don't even have to be a Christian <laughs> because there's a question here from Martina, which you actually, I think, already answered quite beautifully, but I'll read it anyway. She said, Richard, what would you say to those who have become more interested in Eastern spirituality? They only associate contemplation with the East. It's a real challenge to bring the treasures of Christian mysticism alive. I, I really agree with that. I, I, have, I have no hesitation in saying I'm, I'm proud to be a Christian. I, I wouldn't want to be a member of another faith because I love my Christian faith in Christ. Christ is, is my way and my truth and my life. And yet there is such, such treasure in other faiths that is there for us to share and to learn from, not just to dialogue with in a kind of superior colonial way, but to learn from. And of course, you know, my life has been rich with the treasures I've learned from different faiths. I lived in a, when I lived in Indonesia, I lived in a, a Muslim community for four years and I was just bowled over by the, by the community care and the hospitality and the, you know, sides of Islam that often, very rarely get talked about, that, that kind of community of prayer and concern and welfare there. And I've been I've been deeply influenced by, you know, Buddhism and, and Buddhist teaching and on, on prayer and contemplation. Incredible wisdom, really wonderful wisdom. And yet I don't feel in any need to apologize for my own Christian faith. It, at our refugee group, I, I pray for all the refugees who come, you know, with my tradition, and, and, and if I forget to pray, the Muslims remind me, they say, oh, Father, you've forgotten to say your prayers. <laughs> Why should we be ashamed of our own Christian tradition? Other, other faith traditions are not ashamed of their faith. So I, I think we have a lot to learn from one another and a lot to be proud of. And of course, you know, when people talk about, oh, mindfulness, have you heard of mindfulness? I said, <laughs> Oh, Christian tradition is full of look at the look at Jesus going to the silent places. Look at the desert fathers. What wisdom there from the desert fathers and the desert mothers? What wisdom from Saint Anthony of Egypt? What wisdom from the whole tradition of monasticism and and uh, and spiritual writers? You know, Teresa of Avila, Julian of Norwich. Incredible spiritual wisdom. So we have. We have great wisdom to offer, but we also have great wisdom to receive. So true, thank you. John Moore says, not a question, just a thank you. I'm a downtown clergy person in Albuquerque, New Mexico, USA, working with the homeless and trying to foster community. I feel connected and inspired and thank God for all of you and your communities. Thanks to John for that. Well, that's great. And God bless his work as well. Therese Fenzel says, this is so helpful, especially on this day of great stress and anxiety in our country. So true. I'm going to mispronounce this name, I'm sorry, but um, Gahan says, how to start a quality time. 
So Gahan, feel free to, to type in again if I'm misrepresenting you, but I'm thinking back to what you've said, Richard, about the structure of this book, which as you mentioned, begins with silence. And if that really is the best way to begin. I, I think that um, it's the only way to begin. I, 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 I think that often we've, we've lost the ability to listen to God or we don't trust that God will actually reply. So in other words, we, we go into church services and we use a lot of words and our liturgies are crammed with words. And when you're a priest like me, you think unless you're talking, nothing's gonna happen. But actually it's only when you create space that you begin to hear again. I think the best thing about these last nine months is that perhaps we've been forced to listen. And so if I was gonna ask, if people were gonna ask me how they start, I would start by actually structuring some silent time. It could be as, as little as 10 or 15 minutes. And if you've got other people who can help you keep it or you can do it together, or even when you're socially distanced, you know, you, what we do is we keep the same time on the same days. And I actually film it from the church so that everyone knows that at that time I'm going to be praying for an hour. And, and then when I look on the, on the, on the zoo or the, uh, the Facebook live, a lot of people have joined, not watching me, but, but because it's, 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 it's like that orchestra feeling when there's other people praying with you, it really helps. And I would trust that if, if something is of God, God will actually help, help it come to fruition. And all the things that I've done that I feel most authentic are things which have actually created space which has allowed me to get out of the way and, uh, and God's presence to come to the fore. Yeah. Thank you. Um, John is asking, how does the Nazareth community observe the hours of daily prayer pre-lockdown and during lockdown? Well, we, we, have, we have these hours of silence that pre-lockdown, um, those who were able would come to the church to pray together and those who couldn't would pray in their own homes. And so we're a flexible rule, which allows people with different lifestyles or different commitments to be able to still be part of that time of prayer together. And the prayer time was early in the morning from seven till eight. And if people couldn't do that hour, then they would try and do the hour at a different time of the day. Um, when lockdown took place, it was just me going into the church a bit like I've explained and I would just turn on the, the camera facing the east window and say a few words of introduction and welcome people to pray that hour with me and so people um, started praying and during the lockdown I started on a Saturday morning to do a walking meditation um, and I decided to do that through the London parks mm. each, each Saturday. In fact, every Saturday since March, I've been doing a, a meditative walk and that, that's become really popular. People really seem to love that, 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 that uh, you can walk through London and you can discover God in all the kind of sights and smells and beauty and uh, grime of a city. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I should mention to anyone who doesn't have this book in their hands yet that it's full of prayers and poetry that will really assist you in keeping prayer hours yourself. So you can pray with Richard too from wherever you are. <laughs> it's interesting the way the way I I'm I mean you, you honor it to say it's poetry, but what what I was what I used to do is I used to go out um, and um, into a park 
because when you live in a city, you often forget what's outside your window. I know this is stupid, but, but I, I'd lived in, in, as I told you, in, in Melanesia, where you were acutely aware of everything that was going on in nature. So for example, in the dry season, you longed for the rain because it was dusty and the water tanks had all dried up and you knew unless the rain came, there would be nothing to eat. And so when the rain came, everyone used to run into the street and start celebrating and you know, rush down, we used to go, <laughs> go to the top <laughs> where there was a big gutter and the water was rushing off the roof and everyone used to shower underneath the, under the, the <laughs> gutter from the church roof. You were so aware of God's world around you, but in a city you can often forget that. And so um, part of the, 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 the way I wrote this book was to actually go out and sit in a park, come wind, come rain, you know, all, all the seasons of the year, even in winter, even if it's cold, not think, oh, I'm not going out, it's too cold, but actually go out and start noticing, this is cold, it's not gonna kill me, but isn't it incredible this, this inner clock of our world, you know, and, <laughs> and, and, and I went to the same place in the park all through the year and watched how the trees were changing and watched the way everything around me was changing and breathed it in. And, and then after praying for an hour, got out a notebook and scribbled down whatever I thought. And I don't know whether it's poetry, but it was prayers that had come out of that, that contact with, with the natural world. So. Well, there are beautiful words. Michael Moran says to ask Richard about morning prayer and compline on Facebook Live. Yeah, well, Michael's a dear member and a wonderful member of our community. And so it's nice to have him with us. And he's a person who's very influenced by St. Francis de Sale, who's also influenced me. And the phrase that Michael always uses is, bloom where you're planted. So whatever God throws at you, you have to try and bloom in that particular situation. So when lockdown was thrown at us and we were told to shut the doors of a church, which has a policy of being the church with the ever open door, and we had to close those ever open doors, <sighs> we had to think of a way that we would keep going. And like many other churches, we started live streaming our morning prayer and our compline from people's homes. And uh, with phenomenal take up, I mean, we've, we've, we've created a whole online community over these months, which is beautiful to see with people who've been isolated and distance and many actually people who haven't been able to go to church for a long time because of mm. whatever reason, um, suddenly, discovering that 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 um that they too can worship the god in their own home and that's been really beautiful mm. and michael has been very much part of that he's he's a he's a he's a he's a kind of a linchpin man because you know he's always going to be there praying and he's he's got a very generous heart so so people should follow saint martin in the fields on facebook to take part in that well, you could I mean, all I <laughs> We're getting people joining from all over the world, which is rather exciting. So that you sort of pray for South Africa and someone says, oh, I'm, I'm watching this in Cape Town. Thank you for praying for us. So it's, it's wonderful. Oh, that's beautiful. <laughs> yeah. I love it. I think that brings us to the end of our questions, Richard, and we're, we're nearly at the end of our hour together, which has gone so quickly. But thank you so much for this book, for sharing your life, the life of the Nazareth community and this rule that you've really received and um, given to all of us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Could I just, just read the, the, big, the first, how should we say, the first prayer of this book, which I think sums up some of the little, a little bit of what I've said today. Would that, have I got time for that? Absolutely. We plan the holiday in advance but the holy day is today. The monks knew the ancient wisdom of giving each part of the day to God so that they tasted the height, the breadth and the depth of God's presence, the coming of the light, the hopes, the struggles of the day, the intensity of noon, 
the shadows of evening bringing the toil to an end, food and refreshment and silence, and then the darkness of the night. But we no longer notice the movements of the sun. We do not see the sky, just the screen. We've often used the remote and become remote. We who have no time for God have become time's prisoners. We have pulled the curtains on the sun and moon and have closed the windows so that we no longer smell the rain or breathe the air of the changing seasons. We've been given this treasure beyond all price, yet we scarcely noted it. Our monastery is here and now, where you are today. The person you are speaking with or sitting with now, the room you are sitting in, the street where you're walking, the action that you are doing now, this is your monastery, this is your prayer. Eternity begins now. Thank you so much, Richard. Thank, Thank you. you. Having me. And as I said, real big prayers for the United States of America. You don't know how much you are our <laughs> brothers and sisters. You are really in our prayers today. And I expect I will be staying up some of the night listening to you <laughs> and praying to you. Thank you. And our prayers for you as you re-enter lockdown. I'm, I'm, I'm worried we might be right behind you there, but we'll be together in spirit anyway. Thank you, Rachel, because you've, you've interviewed me with such grace. It's, it's very rare that, um, that uh, an interview feels so um, special. Thank you very much for all the questions you have. Well, it's been wonderful, wonderful to speak with you. And thank you to all of you who have been with us for this hour. We've been face live streaming on Facebook and the recording of the launch will be available later on. So we'll be sure to share it with those who couldn't be with us today. And just so everyone knows, to honor Richard to celebrate this new book, all of our titles on monastic spirituality are available from paracletepress.com for 10% off. Just use the coupon code monastic at checkout. And I should also mention that our version of the city is my monastery is available in the US and Canada, but in the UK, I believe um, it's available from Norwich or Hymns a and &M. So. If you're in the UK, it, the book will look different, but it's, it's the same beautiful book. Um, yes, we have some people from Canada asking, yes, the book is definitely available there um, through Indigo, I believe. So I would highly recommend this book, obviously, for personal use, but also perhaps for group study. And just like we've been together on Zoom, I know that churches and communities and book groups have getting been getting together virtually this way. and. I think it's a wonderful way to maintain an established community during these times that no one could have foreseen. So highly recommend, again, taking advantage of this special from Paraclete right now. We also have um, multiple copy discounts. So take a look at our website if that's something that interests you. And um, again, thank you so much for being with us today. We hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as we did. Thank you again, Richard. And yes, our prayers are certainly with all of you all around the world for health and safety. And we hope you'll join us for more of these times together with our authors. Our calendar of online events is available on our website, paracletepress.com. Don't forget to follow St. Martin in the Fields on Facebook so you can participate in their services as well. And thank you again. And God bless you, Richard. God bless all of you. Thank you. Thank you.